and welcome back to our next episode of the Fit Affiliate Podcast. Had to remember which podcast I was on again. Joined by my ever friendly, personable co host, Tony. And today, though, we're very excited to have a couple of special guests being K Star, J Star, the Starettes, um, all things mobility, movement, functional living. If you've been in CrossFit for more than a hot minute, you should have. Uh, should be familiar with the names. And if you haven't, then this is a great opportunity to learn how to make the most of the vehicle that we have as our bodies. Welcome, guys. Thank you guys so much. And I love that. The vehicle of that is our bodies. Yeah, I think that's I love so that. great. I've never thought we're about gonna, those terms. We're going to be borrowing that going forward, Lisa. Thank you. No so, you, you, can, you can have that one totally. Pimp, but your, I mean, my pimp, your, pimp your ride, my souped up <laughs> Pinto with a with an aquarium and a, and a, a huge stereo. That's my current ride. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, yeah, so I'm pumped that you guys are both on the podcast. Particularly, I'm pumped that you're both on the podcast. I mean, you guys have become essentially a bit of a, in the last decade, kind of like pod celebrities, kind of like podcast celebrities. I know that, you know, Kelly specifically, you're on a, a million of them that a lot of people know, but I'm glad that you're both on this one because I think that, especially now that we're, we're talking about your newest book, um, it's actually made a cameo back there. Yes. So it's a um, Product placement. Here, I, back into focus. I, I think it's very cool to see both of you guys reference so um, equally throughout that book, which is probably one of my favorite parts of it. So I'm very glad that you're both on here because I think you both deserve just as much credit. I mean, Kelly, you're, you're fantastic, but one of you is way better looking in the relationship than the other one. And so. <laughs> So no, thank you, Tony. Before. Thank you. Thank you. I was talking about Kelly. Sorry. But, uh, <laughs> No, but uh, I'm glad you guys are both here. So big fan of the book, big fan of it. And, and I know that like I, I dropped in the DMs and, and, and talked to you about getting you guys on here in regards to behavior. But for me, one of the reasons why I think I want to get you both in the podcast is that the book, this book, particularly Built to Move, um, unlike the other books, which were all great books as well, I think does a really good job of tapping into one part of, of human movement that I think a lot of people are starting to become aware of now, which is sort of like the the infiltration of movement into life as opposed to this fascination with intensity of movement and exercise. And you reference that so much throughout the book. And I think that that's a, that's a very valuable part of the book that I, I'm glad that this book takes a, you know, sort of a, an outside gym look at life. Um, and I think that, that part is very cool. Well, thanks for saying that. Yeah. I mean, I think that was one of our goals and missions in, writing this book and, and one of our own, I think, you know, our own evolutions, um, just in our own physical practices and athletic practices in our own lives is that, you know, we've realized over the years that, um, even though we love to exercise, like we're exercise nerds and we'll do any of it. Um, we realize that that one hour a day of exercise idea that, you know, we've told everybody is, you know, the key to health isn't really yeah. enough total movement in the day. And More kinds of movement. And uh, yeah, and it's it's a very uh, often can be a very limited movement diet, right? Like if you just mm. wake up and do the Peloton for an hour and then sit at the desk for the rest of the, your day, you know, your movement diet is two things. Um, you know, and, versus, all, and all just versions of hip flexion. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so I think we started realizing that, um, you know, there's a lot of easy, simple ways to add in a ton of, you know, non-exercise activity and more movement snacks and, you know, little ways to get your body moving through all of its ranges of motion throughout the day that don't require quitting your full-time job and taking up being a fitness influencer full-time. And, you know, I think, I think that's really, you know, we really hope in reading this book, people kind of rethink what a physical practice means and what a movement mm. practice means and, and think about it more holistically, like in a 24 hour cycle. And I'd sure. say also, if I'd add that, you know, if we took our, our fitness industry, the fitness industrial complex, and then just asked, how's it serving our communities? You know, are, how, how's your family being served? Are we on fewer medications? Yeah. Is there, is there less depression? We're seeing an epidemic of, of teenage mental health right now. And mm -hmm. as we try to peel through those layers, we have to say, well, there's some, gotta be some things we can control here. And we, we you know, we have two teenage daughters. One of our daughters just graduated from high school, going off to college. The cohort around us, the number of kids in therapy, the number of kids on meds is really, really remarkable. And I use that as an allegory for the idea of, well, what do we control? 
And in where does that loss of control lay? So, you know, it's really difficult to talk about your mental health or your physical performance if we're not moving, if you're not getting sunlight, if you don't have a community, if you don't eat food, if you don't sleep. So a lot of the things that I think have become important to us, we've been talking about in our, our high performance environments forever. This is this blue mm -hmm. brick, this book, everyone, is the same book and same ideas that we go into tier one military groups world champions, we make sure that they're covering the basis so that we can have a better signal to noise ratio. We can really understand what's going on. And then For simultaneously, sure. not only do we realize that, you know, hey, we're, people need a place to start to be able to untangle what seems like very complex behaviors, but also we, because we had, we're part of the problem of creating an elitist fitness community, we weren't inclusive enough. And that people who didn't yeah. exercise or couldn't access or couldn't go to a gym, we had to say, well, where else? Where does the fitness lie and how can right. we begin to sort of improve our neighborhoods? Can I tell you guys a quick story too? Um, yes. I have this secret skill and that uh -oh. is that within like five or 10 minutes of talking to anyone, I can determine whether or not Crossfit is for them. Mm. Um, I've never talked about this before. No, I've never this heard is my this. first time mentioning this. Um, spoiler. My secret skill, spoiler alert. Hey. Um, but hey. I, you know, Hey, you know me, it's CrossFit for me. It crosses okay, for you, okay. baby. So I, I you know, we, here for six minutes. Does that mean? Yeah, I we, need yeah, <laughs> we, um, you know, we owned a CrossFit gym for 16 years and we were doing CrossFit even a year before that. And, you know, I just, I learned over the years to sort of be able to like kind of check in with where people were from a, you know, yeah. mental, it's, it's mostly a mentality standpoint. Um, Training is for everyone. Let's just be clear. Right. But mm. what I learned from that was that, you know, one thing isn't for everyone. And that's where I really started to become exercise agnostic. Um, man, I don't care if people want to dance or, you know, Peloton or mountain bike, or, I mean, really like, you know, th there's a bunch of like, what I would say are kind of silly fitness things where like people jumping down, up and down on mini tramps and stuff. And I kind of like to laugh at that when I see it on Instagram, but I mean, when push comes to shove, really, I could care less how people move. And I, I realized, I think with sort of my secret skill of can, are you, are you a CrossFit person or not? Is that, you know, not everything is for everybody. And right. so I think, you know, also just giving people that freedom to say, there's no one what right way to do this. Um, yeah. You've got to choose things that you enjoy because if you enjoy them, you are going to do them. And, and, and you're, then, you're talking about health here, not like yeah. going to the Olympics. I no. think that's what's yeah. that's what we're trying to say is yeah, that like, not everything can be scaled up to go to the Olympics or for a war fighter or a collegiate athlete. That's right. that's not what we're talking about. Right. And those are such a small percentage of people. Most of us are like weekend warriors who just want to feel good in our bodies. And as Kelly says, look less gross for our spouse and, you know, maybe keep a little muscle mass on as we age, limit the amount of pain we feel, right? We, we all share a lot of these same goals, regardless of whether we express them through CrossFit or through, mm -hmm. you know, Afri an African dance class. It really doesn't matter. For sure. Um, one thing we can't breeze past those, you guys are not just normal humans because you both have great <laughs> athletic pedigrees. So <laughs> no, you got, you got to take credit where credit's due there. Um, no, and I think um, in, in the book particularly, and I guess it's more than the book, right? Because obviously I've known you guys for a very long time, both through CrossFit and otherwise, but you know, you've always done a pretty good job of, you know, obviously through work uh, Mobility Wab, Kelly, you've done a great job of breaking down incredibly difficult and, and complex subjects into truly just sort of jovial and funny sort of communications. And <laughs> I think that that was really sort of uh, caught on really quick in the community, at least in the CrossFit community. Mm. But one of the things that you guys have done, especially more so recently, I feel like is, and maybe it's just because, you know, I, I follow you both on Instagram and I get to kind of see behind the scenes a little bit more, but like, you know, it's, it's bringing that conversation to a little bit larger of a conversation. Yes. Of health, right. And, and I think we all tend to exist, especially those of us who do exercise semi-regularly. And I would like to go on the record to say right now that by the standards of the book, I am sedentary. Yes, I said it. I'm calling myself out. Um, and I think most people would look at me in my lifestyle and be like, you are the opposite of sedentary. But that just goes to show you just how much more there can be done with just a little bit of attention and awareness. And so I think you guys have done a really good job, especially recently, to bring this conversation to the people who I guess I would say boldly that need it the most, right? Where it's like, and that's not to say that like we're talking about uh, very deconditioned people or unhealthy people. When I say the people who need it most, it's the people who really truly need to understand that 
movement and fitness is about life and health. It's not about, you know, workout scores and more gym time. And there's nothing wrong with workout scores and gym time, but like the point of those things is to get us to go out and do the other things. And I think like we've said it on this podcast a lot of times, but the most important phrase in fitness in 100 words that, you know, Greg put together so elegantly is regularly learn and play new sports, right? And like, it wasn't about going to play kickball as an adult and potentially blowing out a hamstring. It was just taking that fitness outside of the gym and doing some with it. And like this book is a fantastic sort of resource with it, much the same as, you know, Suffle Leopard was with just being that, that, that coffee table reference of like, my trap hurts. What do I need to do? Flip the page, whatever that was. Right. And I think this book is a great reminder of those things. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, this book really is sort of the, like, you know, shows the evolution of our thinking in this space, You're you so know, reasonable. at the, at the time of supple leopard, I think what we were focused on and interested in as humans was, you know, athletic performance. How can we make ourselves and, you know, the, the fancy people we work with better, <clears throat> faster, stronger, and man, like, have we done that in spades? I mean, those of us who are in this space are, you know, taking all the right science back supplements and tracking our sleep and sleeping on chili pads and cold plunging and saunaing and, you know, doing exactly Exactly the right kind of exercise. And, you know, I mean, man, like we are doing better, right. In this little, I would describe fit it as this, yeah, this fit care vertical that we're all in. And, and we've taken those lessons and applied them to the professional athletes and teams we're working with and they're getting better. Um, but man, I, I, we really have seen that we have left, you know, the remaining 99% of humanity behind. Um, mm. we've overcomplicated, uh, health and fitness, you know, we have, we've taken the fun away from it. We've made it about restriction and obligation instead of joy. You know, we really have, I think, made some mistakes. And I think social media has amplified that because, you know, I think for your average working parent and, you know, say in my neighborhood, what they see from a lot of fitness influencers is like, well, that guy obviously works out three hours a day and spends the other two hours meal prepping and sauna and ice bathing and gratitude journaling. And, you know, they're, they're just like, they're, they just go off, you know, that, that just causes them to turn an off switch. And yeah. so I think, you know, we feel and are really passionate now at this phase of our career about trying to find ways to cast a wider net. And, and we feel actually sort of like a moral obligation, you know, as leaders in this community to say, hey, how can we, not just us, but how can we encourage all of us in this space to bring more people into this conversation and make them feel welcome so that health isn't just an elitist thing? And you brought up something I think is really important. We forgot why we were training. We were yeah. training for life. Like what, what, what is it? You know, CrossFit and it's, I'll just use CrossFit as an analogy if people are familiar with that. You know, one of the things about originally about CrossFit was the volume was so reasonable that you could actually go do a sport in the same day. Yeah. That the metabolic demands of the thing didn't mean, and it was, it was actually written about that you don't have to, maybe it's a couple hundred calories, it means you need to eat an extra yogurt and a banana and you right. had covered your nutritional fuel needs and you could still go do another sport. Right now, the sport of fitness is incredible. Those men and women, are, I mean, I really, I love that they're my friends. It's so fun to work there, but you, there is no space for the way people are crossfitting and other sports. And mm. what you'll see is, I think if we take the test of this, and this is, bear with us, this is super esoteric, you see very few CrossFitters succeed in other sports. Yeah. So we see it in maybe Olympic lifting, and every once in a while, there'll be a sport a CrossFitter does. I think we had an Olympian who was a sailor, a couple of Olympic sailors. And really now, of course, Tia has, is, can push a bobsled. But what you're seeing is that those are very specific, very sort of technical, small sports, and they're not... Hey, this per person plays baseball. This person does this because the energy management required and the sophistication diligence means that there's no room for anything else. And so I think it's a valid critique of CrossFit. Hold on. Of course, we can tweak up and down any principles to meet the means of athletes. We've been doing this for two decades, working and coaching. And, you know, I, I don't know, we had six athletes in the Olympics last year we coached. And so one of the things that I think is also a fair critique of the modern strength and conditioning system is that it's so recursive. It's all about, I do pull-ups so I can do more pull-ups so I can have more pull-ups. And I don't go on vacation because my pull-ups will go down. <laughs> and you know, I just want to remind everyone, pull-ups, I'm going to swear here, are a really shitty sport. That's a shitty sport. Yeah. And, <laughs> and what we forgot was, why am I doing all of this? And suddenly if you put 
what is the minimum effective dose to maintain my range, to have bone density, so that I can still go outside and go walk and play and pick up new sports. And so I could play kickball without tearing my hamstring. Mm. Comma, right. the goal is to train to play kickball. And and I think <laughs> that's, and I, I'll say that to give us all a little bit of, you know, a break here. This is a feature, not a bug. The revolution that happened in, in strength and conditioning for the last 15 years, almost 20 years now, it's been a revolution in synthesis and iteration, integration. Now we're starting to see a little bit more normalization. But, you know, I just was talking to a friend the other day and he's like, hey, do you know this guy? And I was like, I've never seen this guy before in my life. And they're like, I don't understand. He has 13 million followers on YouTube. He has 2 million followers on Instagram. And you don't know who it is? And I was like, no. And I went to the site and I was like, oh, this is great bodybuilding. And I was like, I understand why this is so great because he looks great. The people he works with looks great. This has nothing to do with sports or performance or my daughter playing more water polo or my mm -hmm. neighbors feeling better in their body and having less pain. And so you right. can really see that there's a real lot of confusion in the world about what is essential. And what ends up happening is that people fall through the grates and get sort of sifted out and they're left behind. Yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I think um, I never really thought about it until you just brought this up just now, Julia, that that, that um, the role Instagram has really played in the late life sort of evolution of CrossFit. Like, I think for all of us like that are like early 2000, uh, you know, adopters of CrossFit, we lived in like the, the quick time movie sort of like download. <laughs> you, you had to fill your hard drive. It wasn't even on YouTube. Right. Like, right. And I think now I never really thought much about just what the effects would be if had, had I found CrossFit in like 2020, 2021, when I was bored and I had infinite access to like all these things versus like waiting with like bated breath for the next workout to get posted with like some <laughs> random video, uh, you know, uh, of, of Everett or Steel or somebody doing something with <laughs> terrible workout clothes. Um, just so we're clear on that, you know, terrible. And, <laughs> like, you know, but it's not how you work out. It's how you look working out that matters. Everyone knows that. I've been living that dream for a while. You know, look good, <laughs> work out good. That's that's the only thing I got because it's not the workout scores. But I think that that's a fascinating thing. I mean, I don't know as though I, I really had ever given much attention, but yeah, it definitely plays a large role in it. And I could only imagine what it would have been like for me. And like to, to your point, Kelly, about like the athletics and, and like the evolution of, of strength and conditioning as a as a world. CrossFit in general, I think, has done you know a great service to everybody in that regard. At least for, for me, Amen. my ability to stick with something for mm. we're still you know, CrossFit. Yeah, I mean, we're almost twenty years into our experiment. We started CrossFit yeah. in two thousand four. This yeah. we're literally coming up on twenty years. I and mean, we this morning I did ski erg pull ups and sandbag thrusters. We basically yeah. took like a Helen, you know, a Helen framework mm. and then fit it in with the things. So yeah, I mean, we are still. Um, you know, that's how we train primarily. Yeah. And I certainly don't mean to pine for the olden days of CrossFit, but one thing I do miss pining is, for the fjords. I know pining for the old days is, you know, for the first many years we owned our CrossFit, maybe six or seven years, you know, we didn't post our programming. It was just, you get what you get when you show up yeah. and, and you think, don't get upset and you don't get upset. And there was something <laughs> yeah. really special about that because, you know, man, like, I don't know if people even could deal with the fact that like they're used to frequently like two or three times a week in early CrossFit, it would be like five by five back squat. That was the entire workout. Yeah. And I mean, we learned owning a commercial gym and a commercial CrossFit gym that your members literally revolt if that's what you program. Um, <laughs> and definitely if you, if you posted that program in advance, you'd have, you know, crickets in your gym, no one would come to the class, but yeah. it is interesting that evolution, right? Because it's like we did, we, as a, as a CrossFit culture shifted towards what the, um, what the customer wanted, which I think is the right thing to do from a business standpoint, but we had to let go of what we knew was right for them, which is a lot of those people could have stood to just show up and do a really long, careful warm up and a five by five back squat and go about their life and maybe do another sport that day. Um, but we just, you know, we had to kind of adjust to what the market would bear and what the CrossFit consumers and expected. We lost that. We did lose that magic of, I'm not certain what's going to happen. Yeah. I'm not certain yeah. if I, what, what's happening. And remember, yeah you know, perceived danger, very high. Uh, you know, we're in danger, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. coming into it. I don't know yeah, what, it's scary. what Diane Fu has programmed for me. And yet simultaneously, lots and lots of care and, and, and dedication. But what, what ended up happening was we lost some of the intangibles of what was happening. The tight community, it felt yeah. 
it, it feels a little bit like step aerobics with weights because oh, yeah. so much of it is known. Like right. I know how many calories I can do on this machine at this intensity for this thing, at these swings, I can get this many wobbles. And, and so we've just a lot of the uncertainty and openness. L let me give you an example. Unknown and unknowable yes. is no mm. longer a thing. It's right. It's known. And everybody <laughs> wants to know. They, they, yeah. you know, oh, and yeah. I don't almost hate it. What am I getting into? Yeah. God, I mean, members right. almost come into your gym now, like Tony was just saying, sorry to interrupt Kelly, but you know, who have come across CrossFit from YouTube and watching the games. So they come into your gym already like knowing everything and this is what I need. And, you know, I don't need to line a cross ball for 10 minutes before class or foam roll. I just need to get in and I need to max out. And I need to do four hours and they know <laughs> all the things rather than coming and saying, Hey coach, what do I, yeah, what, you're what, the what's expert. my prescription? Yeah. Yeah, What's yeah, you're the expert. You all, yeah, I think, yeah. are, are hinting at this thing that was really magical. When we started CrossFitting, we started using the word coach instead of trainer because a trainer mm -hmm. felt very much bodybuilding and someone programming the selectorized way. Like equipment. machines, machines. And coaching meant I was talking to you about nutrition and sleep and mm. and warm up and pain. I was sort and of serious technique. Yeah, and real serious technique. Serious technique driven. And one of the things that was is so remarkable, some of our gym, you know, we was outdoors for so long and we had coaches who would kind of show up and they would just melt because they couldn't control a room. They couldn't yeah. coach in a big open space. They were used to just turning up the music and just letting people just, you know, do their thing and they just kind of creep around and you couldn't do that in our facility. And people expected you to coach your ass off after an hour of coaching, you're exhausted. I mean, you really were smoked. But one of the things that, we know from our experience in a gym working with people is that people really sometimes could benefit from coaching and that yeah. yoga was a coached environment. Pilates theoretically a very much coached environment. And then CrossFit was one of the very few coached environments where you can actually get coaching the entire time that looked like Mike Bergner's coaching that looked like Greg Glassman's yeah. hands on coaching the whole time. And what's theoretically what's supposed to happen in coaching is that the coach is modifying, tweaking, scaling, giving you extra work, changing things next time, developing capacities. Hey, I see that this whole room is terrible at this. And we lost some of that, I think, as we commoditized fitness a little bit. We yeah. lost the, the individual needs. I mean, everyone needs to squat, no matter what. You may be squatting to a box, three inches, but we are squatting today no matter what. And what we lost was that individual need attention in the kind of greater schema. I think that's uh, we need to come back to that. First principles and then specialization. I will tell you guys that our daughter who's off to college, she goes to a local CrossFit gym and she is like a number one cherry picker. She like checks out the program <laughs> the night before and Good she, girl. she determines like, well, yeah, I don't do that and I don't like to do that. And so, okay, I'm not going to go tomorrow. I'm just going to work out here at our home gym. And so, you know, you, she, she's like, you know, exhibit a of, of sort of one of the problems with all this mm. easy availability of programming, right? Like but she's not choosing any easy things. I mean, she's like, no, what'd you she, do at home? She's like, well, I, I did rowing and heavy, heavy lunges. I'm like, she's okay. She's so funny because she's really good at rowing. And so if there's a rowing workout, she loves to go down there and like slay the adults. Like she can always yeah. get off, like she can get off the rower over, like faster than like the 45 year old guys. And like, it's like, she loves that experience. So, mm. you know, anyway, we digress. Yeah, there, there's something to that, though. I mean, Kelly, you kind of nailed it with, with, with the coaching thing. And I guess that was, you know, to bring it full circle to my point with the Instagram thing. I think that had Instagram been a part of my journey in the beginning, I don't think that I would have stayed with CrossFit because I was never really drawn yeah. to the, you know, the, the new aesthetic version of CrossFit and this, this high athletic version of CrossFit. What I was drawn to in the very beginning was that trauma bond, right? That, that thing where you're just like, I have no idea what's coming out of this this main site workout. I don't even know like, if I can do it. Yeah, you're like, what the hell? Like, I, I distinctly remember my first workout ever was was filthy fifty. But at the time, I was like, oh, that's just you know, fifty reps. That's like a half of a chest day, right? And like, I could do that no problem. And forty nine minutes later, I literally got written up at the Gold Gym. And they're like, if you ever work out that hard again, you will never be able to come back here. And I was like, don't worry about it. I'm fucking never doing that again. Not <laughs> ever again. Right? And then like. Here I am, you know, 17 years later, and it's like, Shocker, this is where I do all the fitness now. You can even see the rings up here. But, like, the point, I guess, is that when I found CrossFit, it was all those unknown and unknowable things. It was that, that sort of, we were all mavens. But the thing that really drew me to it was 
there was a there was a there was a big focus on the elevation in the, in the development right it was the coaches that was the thing like the forum blew my mind as somebody who was a developing coach in gymnastics like the thing that was the hardest thing for me to find was somebody who would share knowledge because until crossfit came along it was like yeah. everything was proprietary right like what i knew was what made me valuable yeah. That's and then really you, I found this, this website and it's like all these world-class coaches yourself, you know, coach Greg, you know, Bergener talk, all these people are like, here's everything I know, just do with it what you want. I was like, this is, and I, I couldn't get enough of that part. Like my original fascination with CrossFit was not to own an affiliate or to even be a great CrossFit. Like I just wanted to be on the seminar staff. And, you know, I made that a reality and was able to do that through, through gymnastics for, for a long time. But like, I think I would have been distracted. Like I, now that you, we just brought this up, I feel like so many people who do get to experience CrossFit through this, this much bigger global lens, they get very distracted by all the things that it's not, which is, you know, the features and, wow. and you know, all these, these functions, but it's like, we have to get back to the behaviors that made CrossFit so great for all of us in the beginning. And this is not necessarily meant to be all about CrossFit, but I do think it's a fascinating conversation that I never would have thought about until you just said that. Yeah. And I will tell you that Kelly has a very similar CrossFit origin story. We were at a gym called Club One in Oakland. And what, what was the workout you discovered and destroyed yourself? And Cindy. Kelly did Cindy. Mm. And I still was kind of skeptical because Kelly had showed me the website and I was like, well, now you're following a neoconservative military cult. So I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm going to just like hold my hands away for a second. Like this is weird. Um, and so I was over shout there. Out South Narc, shout, shout out Shiv Works. There was Kelly. knife fighting techniques on yeah. the site. I was like, this is my site. Yeah. And um, mm. so Kelly does Cindy while I'm over there stair mastering, literally. And, um, you know, something about that and maybe the next workout he did piqued my interest. And I was like, okay, but I think what drew us to it is that we'd been former professional athletes and we thought we were like pretty awesome athletes yeah. and man, we started CrossFit and we were like, we are horrible athletes. Like <laughs> the amount of stuff we can't do. We were weak, out of shape infinite. and unskilled. Yeah. We were weak, out of shape and unskilled. And so I think that part of it actually just made it so fun, right? It's like, you know, you're at the beginning of yeah. a, you know, a lifelong class because you, you realize <laughs> and, how much of a deficit and the you have. the thing that really blew our minds was how it made the things that we love to do better. Suddenly right. my mm -hmm. paddling was better. I was surfing more waves than anyone else. I was, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, like our biking got better. Our yeah. skiing got better. Mm -hmm. And I, again, the root of some, one of the things we talked about is how do we measure what's getting better. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, observable, measurable, repeatable is an old CrossFit mantra. And what we have said, you know, is test, retest, share, right? Like if you didn't make change, you didn't, you didn't see, if you didn't experience change, you didn't make change. Well, right. here we are now saying, okay, let's apply that set of principles writ large to our health and our, our communities. And what we found was through the lessons that the things that we have been having people do or the things that people are defaulting to aren't keeping them healthy, aren't keeping them intact. And that's why we just wanted to say, hey, can we take these principles that we've learned in these high performance environments and spin them into a set of you know, tasks that someone can do every day? You know, mm -hmm. if, you, if you found out you were sedentary, then Tomorrow you get a chance to be unsedentary enough. And if you had to be sedentary again, the next day you get a, a chance to play a different game again. So I think that's really where we couldn't have come up with this book if we hadn't lived yeah. that, that high performance mm -hmm. CrossFit life. Well, and I would say there are two things about um, owning a CrossFit in particular that informed this book. You know, the first thing was realizing that we had this host of what I would describe as like weekend warriors, you know, those would be the classic members of our gym. Um, yeah. and we realized those people also were sedentary. So even though they were doing this heroic thing, which is coming to our gym and, you know, maybe waking up at five 30 in the morning and doing 50 kipping pull-ups and snatches, which, you know, is like extreme, um, you know, they ultimately were sedentary and spending a lot of time sitting and then, you know, ending up back in our gym, but to see one of the physical therapists because they, you know, torn a ligament or had neck pain, back pain, you name it. So it was sort of that group. And then we also, you know, we had a grand and early tradition of private coaching at our gym. Um, and we started that from the very beginning and and both in our classes and with our coaches, what we saw because of what I mentioned before is that, you know, our coaches would have these amazing programs set up and be ready for their clients to come in the door and, and 
the client would come in the door and report that they had taken a red eye, hadn't slept, their baby had been crying all night, they were sick, their neck was hurting, their back was hurting, you know, they hadn't eaten a vegetable in six days. And oh, so and they had three bourbons. And so the our coaches would have to like they'd had three bourbons. So our coaches would have to like slowly wipe off this amazing program they created off the whiteboard and start from scratch because their clients weren't coming in prepared for the training. And so mm. that was another you know, that was Dude, another I, I reason. Re I remember um, running our like games class when we still did that. <laughs> like our people who are going to regionals, like they were so intense. They could do double under. So obviously they should go to regional. Yeah, definitely they going to so elite. Yeah. And uh, it's literally 545 or 530 in the morning. I'm there and everyone shows up who's so elite. And I'm like, how long have you been? You people have been awake. And they were like three minutes. And I was like, we're snatching in seven minutes. Like you're not even prepared for the yeah. warm up that I'm going to give you right now. I'm like, how come you're not taking this seriously? I thought you said you were elite. I'm like, who ate breakfast? And suddenly I started getting into it. Like who, yeah. how much sleep? What did you do? Tell me about yesterday. And I was like, this is all bullshit. Like what we're about to do is adding in like this very complex software onto our Commodore 64. You yeah. I just fully dated myself, but people <laughs> were not ready for the training that we were doing. And we, we even used to, I mean, Julia, bless her little heart. Um, be like, let's do a nutrition challenge. And then we'd kind of go through our members and be like, oh, you had a bag of peppermint patties for dinner. Yeah, you like know? we had um, it was I'm like, oh, oh I what are we're doing here doesn't even seem to be mattering because you can't even yeah. adapt to the response yeah. that we're trying to initiate. Yeah. And you know, so we wanted to give, you know, basically we wanted to create a book that could be like an owner's manual that coaches and personal yes, trainers yes, could yes. give to their clients and say, hey. I want to be able to maximize this time you're here in class or here in this private training session. I want you to get the most out of it. But in order to do that, you need to show up ready to train so that you can actually enjoy the adaptation you're going to have during this training session and get the most out of this workout. But you need to do these 10 things in this book built to move on the regular. And if you do these things, you're going to show up and actually get way more out of this training session that you're devoting a lot of time and energy and money towards. And mm -hmm. so I think, you know, so, you know, just to sort of like circle up this whole CrossFit conversation, I mean, owning a CrossFit gym and sort of working with the general public for over 16 years, like we really learned a lot of lessons that we, you know, and also being employers of coaches for many years and, and coaches ourselves, you know, we learned so many lessons that, drove us to want to write this book. I mean, yeah, and sure. what I think is fascinating and so, you know, I I don't, I, I've only been in the space since, you know, 2011, 2012, so I'm not quite Only. a Just dinosaur a, like Tony. Trevor. Noob. You're a noob. <laughs> Somebody knew her. Total noob, Lisa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Hey, I've still got my, still got my yeah. original Nano 2s. It counts. But, Same. you know, when you, like, um, Kelly, like, I remember when I first started CrossFit and I'd look at the site of the gym I was going to and they had this mobility wad thing at the bottom. I'm like, what is that? So I looked and then I was like, none of it made sense, but your videos <laughs> tapped in. But then as an affiliate owner, when you brought out Supple Leopard, I used that as a tool to for members, similar thing, like, hey, this is how we're going to start preparing for class. Come in early, start phone rolling. Here is, here's the Bible. But what I think is great with Built to Move, which – you know, I've just finished working my way through is that it really takes it down to the level that anyone who doesn't even go to a gym can understand. I was talking to a friend the other day about it, just talking about that sit stand test because, you know, failed miserably and <laughs> was talking to them. <laughs> don't laugh, Tony, um, but <laughs> harsh talking to them. And they're like, what do you mean that? And I said, do it just do it here. And they, they couldn't do it. And they went, Oh, well, how do I fix that? And I went, here's the book, go get it. And the simple steps and the simple rectifications in just three weeks, you know, I've improved my, you know, score on that particular thing just by doing super simple things, which takes it down. And this person I was talking to isn't a crossfitter. They didn't understand, you know, if I'd said, grab out a lacrosse ball and a band, they'd look at me like, well, yeah, you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. So I think this is in like Australia you'd be like, what are we hunting with an with yeah. a band and <laughs> yeah, yeah. a ball? Like yeah, and I think I mean I think what you're you're pointing to, Lisa, <laughs> is what we <laughs> what we what we really tried to do here, and hopefully we did, you know, because the you know, the audience for this is broad, right? Like we think there's mm -hmm. a, a coach 
and weekend warrior athlete kind of audience for this for sure. And in, in those audiences, it's really more like, okay, you're probably doing some of these things, but we know for sure you have blind spots, right? Like Tony is sedentary and mm. you know, you can't do the sit and rise test. And I struggle with the squat test, right? For, for those of us in, in this category, we're going to have things that we're crushing and things we aren't crushing. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then, but also we, we really wanted to make it accessible. So like you could give this book to your mom who could care less about exercise or CrossFit or orange theory or whatever. She's not, she's not eating enough protein yeah. or anything. And, but, but yeah. also it maybe is starting to, you know, see that they're getting older and feeling the aches and pains of old age and, you know, doesn't want to fall and end up in a nursing home. Right. So, you know, we mm-hmm. really tried to figure out like, how can we speak to this very what broad, are the small hinges that are broad audience? That's right. And, and that's so right. I think that's, you know, that's what you're yeah. seeing there, and, Lisa. Yeah. And it just layers on beautifully though. So if people like, oh, I don't have an hour for a mobility protocol, you don't need one. Just that's no, right. 10 minutes. Simple. You're hinting at Keep something I think is really important too, that we try to, we, we've come to a really appreciate is that I think we've sold this or conditioned us all to think, Oh, exercise has to happen in one hour discrete chunks because that's what my mm-hmm. body says. And mm-hmm. so we're right. As long as I, you know, I, oh, if I can't go to this hour long class, I might as well not do anything. Let's go drinking. And mm-hmm. so what we have found because we were working with really busy athletes and war fighters and C-suite folks is that we could get a lot of stimulus in, in small sessions. And we call that stacking behaviors mm-hmm. where we're, we're saying, you know, you'll notice that our first intervention is sitting on the floor watching TV. So we're like, Hey, why don't you do all that 90, 90 and long sit and kneeling and all the hip mobility that you're doing in class. Why don't you do that for 30 minutes while you're watching the TV? And what we saw was that, man, if people just started messing around with their hips a little bit, their cycling improved. We saw elite performance cyclists start to have better wattage and less back pain because they just were improving their hip range while sitting on the ground. And so when we started to get out of this one hour kind of block mindset, what we found is that there was a whole lot of time and agency in where people could have net positive impact on how their brains worked, on their bodies worked, and really ended up covering the basics if we just got out of, hey, it didn't happen in a formal environment, as you said, I'm not going to go to a one-hour mobility class. You don't need to. And, in, right. and this really matched up with what we experienced clinically, that if we got people to engage with 10 minutes of soft tissue work, of input, of soft tissue mobilization, they could feel better. They could have less pain. They could restore their range of motion. They could downregulate and go to sleep better in 10 minutes. And no one could look me in the eye and be like, I don't have 10 minutes. And I was like, oh, shit. You totally have 10 minutes. You're just lying. Well, and you know, the data, the data is out that Americans at least are watching between one and three hours of TV a day. And that's like across all spectrums, you know, there, you know, no one wants to admit it. Um, which is why I really respected Tony that you admitted that you're sedentary because, you know, part of it is, is just the admission. I'm taking four walks this week. Just so <laughs> clear, I read the book. Uh, yeah. You're like, Oh, I need to start additional walking. walks. They were not originally planned. <laughs> um, I totally lost my train of thought. I don't know what I was saying. Sorry about that. No, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Go it's, forth. it's it's funny when you're talking about the, you know, people watching, you know, up to three hours of TV a day because it's been everything's so accessible now before, like when there was a blockbuster, you had to walk down the street to your blockbuster, walk around the aisles, pray to God that whatever you want to watch was there, take it home, watch it, and then return it. Whereas now it's like three clicks of a button, you've got That's right. yeah. whatever you want. So yes. we're not set up to succeed in that area. Like yeah. everything is just on demand. Well, and I think that's the the key is that our environment is, you know, working against us in so many ways. You know, it's, it's you know, there aren't sidewalks in a lot of places. You know, it's, mm. we have to drive everywhere to do the things we like to do. Um, or, or at least we've, we think we have to, we've conditioned ourselves to in many cases, you know, like the example that I like to give is I started this thing at our kids elementary school called a walking school bus. Um, mm. And what I realized is that and the research shows that American kids, anyway, most American kids, like 95% of them live within two miles of their elementary school. Um, and when I was a kid in the seventies and early eighties, well, I guess I was still a kid in the eighties, but, um, it was something like, you know, 75 to 85% of kids back then walked or biked to school. And it turns out they didn't live closer to school. 
they lived the same distance. It was still around two miles away or, or less from their elementary school. But now it's something like, you know, 10 to 15 percent of kids walk or bike to school. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. People, you know, thanks to, you know, like sensationalization of some kidnapping cases. And otherwise, like a lot of parents got worried that it was unsafe for their kids to walk to school. And then same thing. We just our environment conditioned us like our entire our kids entire elementary school was front of the school was based on this drop off lane. And we yeah. had to like spend money on the drop off lane and staff it with volunteers. And right, like that's a classic example where we have worked hard and spent a lot of money to make it easy for people to get in their cars and drive their kids to school when they literally live a half mile away. And so we started this thing called the walking school bus where we said, hey, look, every single day, Monday through Friday, rain or shine at the exact same time, we will be standing there. And we will mm -hmm. walk your kid to school with our kids um, mm -hmm. so that you feel that your kids are, you know, the kids are safe and, you know, they're going to make it to school and um, someone will be there. And, you know, we expanded it so that we had other parents helping. And it, it turned out to be this really, in addition to, you know, getting kids moving, getting out of the car, you know, Kelly and I would start our days like by 8, 10 in the morning, we'd have 5,000 steps logged already. Yeah. Um we had a chance to interact with our kids. We made friends with members of our community. I mean, this thing had like wide ranging positive impacts, but it really did just take, hey, how can we think about this thing that we take for granted every day, which is loading our kids in the car and driving them and dropping in the drop off lane. Um, you know, and, and I mean, I know you live in a snowy place. It's harder, you know, whatever. But I mean, I will say that my brother and I Snow somehow boots. somehow <laughs> lived like a mile and a half from sorry. elementary school in a snowy place and we still made it to yeah. school. Besides, every child in Australia has. Street. That's right. Every child in Australia has a machete to protect from yeah. snakes. <laughs> we can, we can just door. cut our way plane. through and oh. and we'll, we'll through. And I grew up in a small country town, and I was just talking to um, my wife about it the other day. Is like I was never home. We yeah, from right. an early age, mum was like, "You're walking to school. I'm not taking you. Just and go." There's nothing and nothing to do was, at home. Yeah. No, and you know, I'd be go out to well, if you're home, there'd be jobs to do, so no one has got time for that. So <laughs> it was like I'd go up to the school oval and hit golf balls, or I'd tow my golf clubs kilometers to the golf club to go and practice, or I'd just ride around the streets till you know the lights came on and it was time to go home. That's just what we did. And, and I think when we do talk, that. when we talk to parents about that, I think a lot of us, especially as we're saying, okay, you know, I think let me pack back up when you take this book at face value and you start applying, we think it's easy to get 10 out of 10. These are actually really reasonable approaches. We're, we haven't gotten, this is not, you don't have to become a monk to get these things done. You just have to be a little more intentional. But then I say, okay, you're killing it. Great. Let's just apply the same 10 out of 10 to your children. How's that going? And what you're like is, oh, it's tough. You know, my kids didn't sleep. They didn't eat anything. Uh, they didn't move. I mean, it's really, it's gnarly. And some of that, I think, is our fault for sure. Because like you said, we didn't have a choice. And now that we have choice, we have to sort of manage that choice Absolutely. consequence, which yeah. means that we have to be thinking about getting our kids out and doing things. And, and I think if we had had TikTok, you oh, know, YouTube, we would have done the same thing. I'd I mean, have been all over it, you know? Oh, so, we would have been all over it. So yeah. I mean, I'd have been suspended so yeah. many times for doing yeah. stupid stuff yeah. on camera. But I, I think yeah. that, you know, the point Kelly's making is when we were kids, you know, we didn't, there wasn't those options. And so mm. it almost wasn't yeah. a choice you for us, right? Now. Yeah. And so now we mm. do unfortunately need to be intentional and, and purposeful about making sure that, you know, we're always trying to get as much movement as possible and saying, Hey, do I actually need to drive to the grocery store? You know, we've yeah. got a grocery store. That's what, like, what is Safeway? Like a mile, half mile, you know, and mm -hmm. we find ourselves sometimes just, okay, we're just jumping in the car and we could easily walk down there and carry back some groceries. Um, yeah. you know, and there's, there's a thousand other little wanna, small decisions. I don't want to make myself like tired from a workout later though. Yeah. There's a yeah. thousand little decisions <laughs> like that we make every single day, you know? And, um, and it's, I think unfortunately we need to be intentional about it because our environment is working against us. Our yeah. environment is encouraging yeah. us to be sedentary and sit on mm. our phones. And it's, yeah. it's like Tony and I have had some conversations about like, you know, I'm trying to get more movement into my day and get back into regular, training and routine and you know i was saying well i need to do this and come up with this and tony's like just fucking walk like just walk yep. like just just move more in your day like intentionally move rather than because as humans and i'm very guilty of it as tony will be quick to For tell you so yeah it's weird <laughs> over complicating things and trying yes. to JFW have all is actually other coaches have talked about the alan cousins 
um, mm. Steve Magnus. They they use it like people are like, hey, what? How should I get my Zone Two in? And they're like, JFW. Like you know, people are like, what's JFW in the comments? And people are like, just freaking walk. Yeah, <laughs> really. We uh, I want everyone to understand that we have we were at a, a book signing and one of our friends who's a very good athlete, middle-aged athlete like us, very middle-aged. And she was like, <laughs> I take offense. I'm an elite dad athlete. Um, she said, I take offense that what you don't consider a walking exercise. And mm. we said, hold up. We want you to understand that we think walking is so important that we want to move it out of exercise category. We wanted to put it into this is so essential yeah. to your being for your seeing friends, being outside, moving your body, decongesting, creating fatigue, all of those things. We want to move it into like, well, is food optional? <laughs> you know, is is sleep optional? Well, walking, we want to categor recategorize it as essential human input. For sure. Yeah. I think, you know, culturally, the exercise culture, not it's not a crossfit thing, but it's, it, we, we tend to make things, we make perfect the enemy of good and i think this book does a really good job of getting people back to being like oh you know this is the framework this is the basics so like and i you see that so much across the board like to your point where you're like if i can't if i can't make it to my class today i might as well just go get drunk with my friends or do whatever and i think that that part of it is 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 truly unfortunate because it kind of brings us back to the original conversation which is how we keep getting into crossfit which is you know, obviously our audience is predominantly affiliate owners or, or interested affiliate owners. And, and so one of the big struggles with them is essentially, how do I get people in the gym to do this exercise type thing? And like, I think that we have always often, more often than not evolved to make perfect the enemy of good as it applies to that. Because like to your point earlier about coaching, Kelly, it's that, that was the beauty of what made Cross it. Cross it. And particularly, it gave people access to this thing called a coach, not like that high school one they had who was like somebody's dad who volunteered, but like it was this person who took a whole best coaches in the world. Yeah. A holistic approach. I don't like the word holistic, but it kind of is, right? And and so for us here on the podcast, we talk about all the time the difference between what is an instructor and a trainer and what is a coach. And, and really that all centers around one foundational difference is that coaches are here to understand and they're here to make changes and they're here to, to, to basically evolve whatever it is they do. Instructors or trainers are bound to a rigid sort of curriculum and format that they have to deliver. And like when things go off script, they're just like glitch back to it. And like, that was the beauty of CrossFit. And I think to bring it to the whole circle of this book, the, one of the biggest things that's affecting coaches today or developing coaches is that it's the, truly the absence of why, right? And we, around here, we say it a lot, the absence of why, what's become wise. And what that really truly means is that when, when these coaches don't understand what the why is, which is life, health, you know, wellness, et cetera, you know, in, life, in health span, not just lifespan, they tend to get caught up in the what's, the curriculum, the points of performance, what I need to do, who's going to the games, what's the open standard, like all of these things that are, Sure, they're important in their impact in those moments, but what it means to be a coach is to get people that last line of fitness in 100 words. And in this book, I think does a really good job. And I assume at this point, I don't need to tell anybody in the cross community specifically to go read any of the books that you guys put out. But this book, more than anything, I think is one of those succinct you know, demonstrations of that we need to be reminded more than we need to be told. There's nothing in this book. Truly, no offense to you guys, it is groundbreaking, right? But it is a succinct and truly humbling, in my, in my own experience, of demonstration of like, holy shit, I've lost my way, right? This book, in a lot of ways, kind of gets to that, you know, across this new thing about the North Star. But like, this book is the North Star because the point of all of this, the whole thing has always been not how much fitness can you do, but how much can you do with your fitness? And somewhere that got lost. And I think this book, particularly crushes it, knocks it out of the park. It's not just Kelly telling you to stick a lacrosse ball in another, you know, nefarious region in your body. Like this book <laughs> is literally just like, can you straight up get up off the floor? And I know a lot of fit people who are like, yeah, I know they can't. And they can't. Right? Like, yeah. Sit on the floor. Right? I've taught seminars around the world for over a decade and I always made every single seminar sit on the floor for the lecture yes. and they were just, yes. Yeah. Yes. But people, yeah. Like people start freaking out when you ask them to sit on the floor. I mean, even really and athletic people. Yeah. And, 
You know, I, I think you're right. I mean, we we would never say there's nothing in here that's groundbreaking. I think the only thing that's new and different about it is that it it I think we've done a good job of showing how all of these behaviors interact with one another, right? Like like James Nestor wrote a great book called Breath. And, yeah. you know, everybody should read Why We Sleep. And, you know, there, there's some key books on, on even specific chapters that we have here. And obviously there's a billion books on training and nutrition and, you know, obviously mobility, right? But we never could find a book that was like, how do all these behaviors interplay with one another? Um, and, you know, and realizing that, look, if you think about every single day as a 24 hour cycle, you know, where do you fit all these behaviors in and what do they mean and what do they mean for your overall durability and, and what's practical, right? Like there's other books out there right now about, you know, longevity is like a hot topic right now. There's other books out there, um, you know, and, and everybody's talking about lifespan, health span, longevity. Yeah. Um, but you know, in some of those books, it's like, well, who's going to get eight colonoscopies a year, right? Like yeah. who's got, right. So it's like, it's like, you know, we're, we're into long, we're into like realistic longevity and durability, not yeah. like, you know, one percenter longevity and durability. And that's great for the one percenters um, who have infinite amounts of money and time to spend on, you know, really super cool technical yeah, make stuff. It your hobby. That's there's nothing yeah, wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. Like we have no problem with that. But again, our personal mission is to see how we can sort of expand a wider net. And, you know, yeah. I, I will say, I feel like we back, back to what you were saying about the why, you know, I think we did some things really well at San Francisco CrossFit that I'm really proud of. And I think were, were our effort to always stay focused on the why versus the what, you know, we had some really basic things that we always did, right? Like you had to wear your shirt in the gym because that's we, not true. That's not true. You had to cover your nipples. You had to cover your nipples, but you know, so you could wear like a half shirt, but you know, so men, you could take your shirt off, but you had to cover your nipples. But you know, our whole mission from the beginning was how do we make a really welcoming client? open place for people. Mm -hmm. That's the why, mm -hmm. right? Because if you have a big, wide open, welcoming community, that's going to be more diverse and more open and fun. And, you know, that's going to give people the why to come because they're going to see other people in there who look like them. You know, we were, we had a mind towards making sure our staff was actually diverse so that again, our clientele could come in and say, Hey, you know, I see someone that looks like me and I feel more comfortable here. We made sure that everybody who walked in the door was acknowledged um, we made people introduce themselves at the beginning of class. I mean, that's apart from the fact that we think we had some of the, you know, most amazing actual CrossFit coaches and coaches, yeah. you know, doing the classes. But honestly, that's not what we cared about or talked about because we knew we spent the time to train our coaches and ourselves to be the best. And, you know, we would have staff meetings and talk about like, how can we make a more welcoming environment for people because that's the why that's what keeps people coming back. Um, and you know, that that's what keeps Jim humming is all mm -hmm. those things that honestly are peripheral to coaching okay. people and mm -hmm. putting them through the A to B of a workout. I mean, I wrote an article for like box magazine, you know, to totally oh, age myself Pro. like box pro magazine years ago. You are about, hundred years old. I'm a hundred years old called the difference between the, <laughs> well, like, I read it. So I'm just as old. Yeah, we did yeah. thrusters with wooden it bars. Like, it was like the, you know, my point was like, there's a workout administrator and a coach, right. And a workout. And there's, there's still, you know, depending on the CrossFit gym, there's still a lot of CrossFit gyms that unfortunately just have workout administrators. You know, they tell you what the yeah. workout is. They press play on the clock. Maybe they high five you a little bit throughout the workout. Make sure, you know, they, they can kind of manage Don't the, get in the way of your intensity. Um, you know, yeah. and then there's the real coach, right. And the coach is going to be that person Kelly talked about before who is exhausted at the end of class because they've been continuously talking and helping people scale and, you know, make, make changes in people's techniques. And I mean, it's a constant thing. And, you know, it, it was like, you know, if, if a coach wasn't talking during a class at San Francisco CrossFit, you're like, what's wrong with them? Are they sick today? Um, I, and did so all, I did all the warmups and I'd walk around and I think I, I was so loose and ready to go. And I got 50,000 steps a day. I was like, this is the greatest yeah. fitness regime ever. <laughs> yeah. So I think and I had a I demo, think, like you know, one pull up, like th 30 times. I know we were just talking about built to move, but I, you know, I love, I, I think the, the why of, you know, why people come to the gym. I mean, I think ultimately in our experience, I mean, yes, the original reason people came to the gym was to get fit and, you know, be healthy and get abs or whatever their, you know, sort of physical goals were, but they kept coming back because, you know, Kelly always described it as a third place. Like often our gym was the one place in people's lives where they could experience unconditional positive regard. People were happy mm -hmm. to see them. They knew their name. They saw their friends. They met 
met their spouse, you know, like it was, that was what kept people coming back. And in many ways, the fitness part of it for a lot of those people was like a nice to have, but peripheral. Mm. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that affiliates in general are obviously fascinating place for all the reasons we know them to be in no doubt about it, you know, the vast majority of them certainly struggles, especially if they're probably listening to this because that's most of our audience. And one of the big things is like just understanding their value proposition. They're trying to figure out how they can sell this system, this methodology for more money. But the whole thing has always been shrouded right there in front of them. That it's That stuff is not what you're selling. What you're selling is what that stuff will get you. And that has always, I think, been the piece that's been missing. No, I wouldn't say always been missing. I think that it's just a natural sort of inclination to get caught up in all of the you know, points, performance, the features, the, the the scores and the quantification. But, you know, this, I, I think we live in a time now, at least maybe, maybe I live in this confirmation bias, but, you know, I think there's a lot of people in the community, yourselves, myself, Spieler, et cetera, who are doing less fitness, but doing more with the fitness. And I feel like personally, that is the single biggest public service that most of us could do to, to really just show people that like, Hey, the point of the gym was to get out of the gym, not to spend more time in the gym. And if I hear one more person tell me that they won't go mountain biking or skiing with me because they don't want to get hurt, <laughs> but they work out multiple times a day, I'm like, the point of everything you do is that you can come learn to ski with me. Right? Like, the, well, I need to be able right. to work out. I'm like, I assure you that that also counts as working out and you'll be fine because hopefully the, the 10 years and the 10 hours a day that you've been spending here will afford you the ability to at least crash down the hill a handful of times. Yeah. Like, right, right, right. To build the, here. yeah, like hopefully all this CrossFitting you're doing or whatever workout you're doing is helping you build the durable body you need to be able you to think. go do those things. Yeah. Right. Well, I think Spieler did a post the other day where he did a jump, came off, crashed, but because of, you know, his lifetime of fitness, yeah, in the backyard, he could jump up and, you know, keep going. He went, yeah, I'll be sore tomorrow, but, you know, I could didn't have to lie there or need to be medivaced out. Like it's, yep, I took a hit, but I could get myself back up and keep going. And I think that we when we made that, Greg made that original fitness, you know, spectrum continuum. We talked about health as being area under the curve over the long haul mm-hmm. in that three-dimensional model. You know, really, I think we started to appreciate how we valued being durable. You know, I've had a knee replacement after a bad ski crash. Um, you know, one of us has had breast cancer. Um, you know, there has been, we've seen unequal results from the surgeries, from the, you know, the, the psychic stress that have impacted our families mm-hmm. compared to other families who don't have a schema for taking care of their bodies or taking care of their nutrition or, you know, having some, you know, some muscle mass and, and ligament and tendon health. And, and what we really said was, was we started to appreciate this idea that you're, as you said, fitness wasn't just to have great abs to win Instagram on a Tuesday and, you know, in June. I mean, that's great. you all your friends, you know, it's a thirst trap and your friends love you and you look great. But we really appreciated that the goal of this thing was to actually have a system that you could rinse, wash, repeat for decades. So when the hits came, you were going to be ready for it because the hits are going to come. You're going to get sick. You're going to get in a car accident. You're going to crash on your bike. And, and all of the things that we're really talking about in this book, you know, are the, we feel like, or is the model so that you can come back and be a little bit more durable. And if you're listening to this and you're a coach or you're training we also wanted, as Juliet said, create a, a resource that you could hand this to your auntie and uncle who will never yeah. come see you. They'll never come train with you. But this is the way to bring people along on this journey because we have come to believe more and more the household, the community is the the neighborhood. That's the functional unit of change. We just have to change uh, and improve our own families and then we can have the real next conversation. Yeah. And also give, you know, coaches and affiliates a way to say, Hey, you know, we can help you for the hour you're here, but there's 23 hours of other hours of the day. And here's a consolidated model of what you can do on those other 23 hours so that you can keep coming back here. Because I mean, that's the other thing, right? Like we want as affiliate owners, you want your clientele to feel good and be out of pain and, you know, want to come and be ready to train and not be worked. And, you know, people need help with that, those other 23 hours. And, you know, we can't, your coach can't be following you around in your whole life and giving you grams and protein and whatever. Right. So it's like, Hey, what we're hoping is that coaches will say, Hey, 
go to Amazon right now and buy this book and do these oh. things for the other 23 hours. And I'll see you tomorrow for your training session. And we're going to slay. Here's your protein shake, the Wahlberg. I, I think that the, um, <laughs> The way that you've described the strategies in the book, you've linked it into things that people are already doing. Like, cool, you want to watch Netflix for 30 minutes at night? Yeah, That's your yeah. routine. That's We're not telling you don't watch Netflix, but sit on the floor while you're doing it and, here, yeah, move your legs in these positions. Like, it's tied into things that we're already doing. Like, you're already sleeping, but here's a few easier things that you can do that's going to make that better for you. Not, You don't need a whole new routine. You don't need equipment. We're just intersecting these activities in something that you're already doing. I mean, members used to say to me, I don't have time to roll out. I went, do you watch the news? Yeah. Get on the roller while you're watching. That's, right. like, That's exactly right. Super that simple. But it's coaching. Yeah. It's, it's just not extra things like I don't have more time in my day. I know you, that you're binge watching Bridgerton or whatever it is. Like just sit yes. on the floor. Sit on the yeah. floor. And also, you know, um, thanks to COVID, there's so many more people working at home oh, and, yeah. and, you know, that's been generally bad and increased our sedentariness. But I think if, if people thought about their home work situation as, okay, I, I don't need to stand all day and I don't need to sit all day, but let me see how many times I can change positions, you know, oh. and, and if someone had like a high speed cam that followed me on the days I work at home, you know, I spend a few years, a few hours standing at my kitchen counter. I go over and sit in my living room at my coffee table on the ground for a few hours. You know, right. then I feel tired. I sit in an actual chair for a few hours, right? Like I, I really am just trying to constantly be changing positions. You know, as Kelly says, yeah. it's like, you know, your best position is your next position. And so mm -hmm. that's the framework where I go into my workday. I don't go into my workday saying, I'm going to stand here like a statue all day and be a total hero at my standing desk. <laughs> I just think to myself, like, man, I need to adopt a bunch of different positions today, take my body through a bunch of different shapes. Sure. And, and then that's how I'm going to buffer, you know, being able to sit. And then when I do sit, I really enjoy it. It feels awesome. Mm. And yeah. One of the things that you hit on, Lisa, that I love is that this is a, we try to be expansive here. If we take the nutrition chapter, for example, just to give some people some examples of a couple of things and how these tie together, um, you know, because we're in this incredible community, we ran into this woman named E.C. Sinkowski of, at mm. Optimize Me Nutrition. Everyone should know E.C., but her, you know, eating models try to eat 800 grams of fruits and vegetables every day. And, and she has lazy macros. You can count your proteins in there too. But we, that was the first time for us. Cause Juliet and I felt like diet survivors, like yeah. the cultural diet war. Like we were like sure. refugees and especially in CrossFit where we were like, Oh, it's low fat. No, no, it's zone. We count yeah. almonds. And now there's a thing in, in TikTok that our kids, it's called being an almond mom where you count almonds for snacks. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so don't be an almond mom and push your diet culture agenda on your kids. But then it was keto and then paleo and then carnivore. And we were just like, holy crap. Now what we really have become is agnostic because we recognize that all diets are unvalidated and that ultimately show us you can get enough micronutrients and fiber, enough protein. We don't really give a crap how you want to solve that. But one of the mm -hmm. things we noticed was that when we started giving people benchmarks, clear vital signs, metrics that were attainable, objective sort of levels of these things, then we could really start to get through the noise. Because I think that was where we were missing out on a lot of these things. And so suddenly what we see was like, we're like, oh, you're a vegetarian? Cool. You haven't had any protein today. Or you're carnivore? Cool. You haven't had any micronutrients today. Like what, what's your plan for this or no fiber? So when we give people these, these levels, suddenly a lot of other things start to happen. Like, for example, intermittent fasting was a good kind of you know, we, we called it calorie control for adults. And early on, Juliet and I were like, hey, this is kind of interesting. And what I, I did some intermittent fasting and I was like, I really like this. Like, I don't have to eat. I'm not really hungry in the morning until I got to the afternoon and my workout sucked because I was under fueled. And then I got yeah. to the evening and I was super under calorie and I eat a jar of peanut butter and three chickens and like five cookies. <laughs> and then I would sleep like crap because I'd eaten a jar of peanut butter, three chickens, five cookies. And then, you know, wake up the next morning and be like, wow, let's do it again. And so what we started realizing is that when we gave people clear objective measures and expanded their choices and said, hey, this is up to you how you want to get this done. We don't really care then people could make choices based on their needs and their demands and the realities of their life. But it was an expanse of not, hey, we're going to take this thing away from you. So you're living this weird, austere, austere bubble that's not sustainable. Sure. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think awareness precedes action is a quote that comes up here all the time, mm -hmm. right? And I think, you know, test, retest is probably the thing that, you know, 
made Kelly Mobility Wad so famous was just like such a simple thing was such a missing piece of such a, a common pursuit where right? everybody knew they couldn't move well at all and something was in the way. And it's such a simple phrase that I think we can all recite in our sleep and actually hear Kelly saying it's just test, mm. retest, right? Like, and that simple thing, which is like, oh, but then the the return on that investment was always so fascinating. Everybody was like, well, I'm going to stick this lacrosse ball all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I think we all got to that point in this book, particularly embodies that exact thing. Not so simply as test, retest, but it's in there. That whole framework mm. is still present in every single yeah. one of these chapters, right? Like, you know, you guys do a fantastic job of not just telling people what to do and making people feel bad because they don't get enough steps in and all these other things that they already know that they're supposed to be doing, you know, broccoli and water, we all know it, but like, it's an awareness piece, right? It's, you know, the ability to the sit test or, you know, or all the, the shoulder tests, all these things that like, you tend to forget and overlook and then you do them as somebody who is very proudly, you know, you know, a fitness person, you're like, well, that was way harder than it should have been for the amount of effort and energy and investment that I've put into this, that's right. this journey. And I think the book for everybody that's listening to this, is truly a million dollar framework. If, if you read wow. this book, and I, I challenge anybody to read this book, and you will likely probably read it, and one of two things is gonna happen. You're gonna be like, this is literally gold. This will quite literally change my approach to everybody that comes in this gym and how I'm going to continue to push them forward. And I can make a lot of money doing this. Not that it's all about the money, but it's for sure not, not about the money. Right. And, or you're gonna read the book and be like, I don't get it. And I, I promise you, if you're one of those people in that camp, you need to spend more time until you get it because you have to understand the entire career that you're engaged in is not to get people better in that gym. You have to get them outside of it. And as somebody who made the mistake, lived the lessons, did whatever, like it's the Hunter S. Thompson quote. Right? The point was not arriving at the grave in a preserved body, which is ironic because the whole thing we do in the gym is to abuse the body. But like, you know, I'm a grown ass child who can crash my mountain bike a lot and I do on a regular <laughs> basis and I just bounce up. But as a 42 year old, I'm one of the anomalies in my friend group for that reason. Those are the rewards of fitness. And I think this book does a fantastic job of not just telling them what to do. It does a great job of being like, oh, that test did not go well. All right, I'm going to go. <laughs> I've taken several walks. Three yeah. of them yesterday. Keep which it is, up, Tony. Which is where I got to going through it. went, oh, I nailed the breathing test. Like, nailed that. So that's my hill I'm going to die on. But everything else, you're like, oh, this is... I don't do this as intentionally as I need to. Sorry? What time is it for you in the morning? It's like 3.45 a.m. No. (laughs) But we blame that on you at the start of the call. That's fine. Yes, this is always my fault. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I think it's a fantastic resource for all those reasons. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You guys did a great job with it. I mean, again, you know, all the books, everything you guys have produced have always been a fantastic resource. I think this one, you know, Everything else is like a coffee table resource. I think every cross at home I've ever been into ever has like some leopard on the coffee table because you come home and it's like that thing again, right? You know, <laughs> page, whatever. But this is like a, you know, this is, dare I say, like a, this is like a nightstand. This is like a bed and end table yep. sort of thing where like hopefully yep. people pick this up as a, as a regular reminder. And like the whole point of everything that we do and, you know, everything that you guys have done, your life's work has been like, to get people to live better lives. And I think we somehow just missed that, you know, in the development and the process, because it was very fun to get caught up in the scores and oh, yeah. the records oh, and all these things. Yeah. And like those things are cool. No doubt about it. Cause they're the things that afford us the ability to keep going and get to that point. But like, maybe it's cause I'm old now. Maybe it's cause I'm at that midlife crisis, but I'm like, you know, what's really cool that like, I just finished a 24 hour endurance event and I didn't train for it. Right? I can crash my mountain bike several times a year. Yes. And I don't, I don't yeah. train for that. I skied, you know, 65 days this year. Like those things don't require any additional training. Just I do some pull-ups over here every once in a while. And, and I sit on this concept two bike all day long to get some of my, but that doesn't apparently count towards my steps. Thanks to you guys. So um, <laughs> I'm taking more walks, but um, you know, I think that that's a cool part of the book. And I think, mm. you know, we need to be reminded more than told and this book is a fantastic resource to do that. Oh, thank you don't guys feel, so much. You don't feel yeah. bad for, for where you're at. It's like, okay, we get that you're not at this point, but here's a couple of things you can do and come back and retest. And the simple things, you know, just you don't feel like a failure before you start. So I think that's going to help people stick with it. And that's a rare thing to find in a lot of these um, life books where you can, you can read it and go, well, I sucked as a human, I'm out. And you just put it down. <laughs> like, that didn't make me feel good reading it, but, yeah. you know, I didn't feel like that reading 
you know, built to move for sure. Well, Is thank it, you guys. Thank you so much for having us on. It's been so fun to chat you up. For sure. I, it was definitely a pleasure to have you guys back on. I'd love to have you back on again. I mean, the book is a very personal journey for me. I think that, you know, as I, one last personal story, it was very emotional for me to read that book. There's two things that I think that I failed at in my journey as a, as a fitness professional. And the first of which was that I was very distracted and wasn't able to get my mother to come in the gym. And this book really kind of brought that into reference where like, I could have just made it so much simpler for her. She was so afraid of, of the, the chaos and the intensity and all those things. And, and I wasn't really ever able to get her to do that. And, and, you know, now I feel like I have this resource. And so it's already been given to her. There's Love multiple that. copies of it. And so I'm like, everybody in this house, read this book. And then, you know, the other side of it is that I just lost, you know, my father in February, you know, to, oh, to sorry, an unfortunate sudden instance. But, you know, the thing with him is that what I do now is help save people from their work, right? Like I don't want people to work till they die. I want them to live their life. And unfortunately for him, you know, he worked right up until he died. And if I could have just given him this book, this was right in the alley. He was like, you know what I want to start doing? I'm going to retire soon. I'm going to start walking the dog around the, the block. And I was like, please do it. And he never got a chance to do that because oh, he worked right up until the end. And, and I think for me, the book was very personal for that reason. And that if, you know, if I could have had the book and I should have had the book and I could have given that book to more people, I think it would have, it would have saved more lives. And so if anybody's listening to this, the book is fantastic, but the work that you do is, is so much bigger than you realize inside that gym. Like give the book to people, but really just give people their life back. And the book does a fantastic job of that. So thank you guys for creating that resource. Thank Love you very it. much. Thank you so much. Okay. Thanks guys. And um, thank you as always, Tony. And we'll uh, see you on the next one. Thanks again for having us.